All right, so we're on. So first off, uh, Dr. Freud, I want to thank you. I know this is not the kind of thing you do often, but of so many of the people I know, if there's one person that should or that could do it often, it's you. So the fact that you said yes to my invitation to speak about functional neurology, uh, when I consider you the expert in this neck of the woods, uh, uh, and obviously it's the reason why I went to see you a few years ago to see how you work, uh, and I was very impressed, and I thought, okay, this is like, this is functional neurology really well done, and considering, you know, your teaching experience and your passion for the field, so I would like for everyone that knows me to know you better, so if you can take a few moments and say uh, who you are. Well, thank you, Matt. That's very, very generous of you. Very kind words. I appreciate it. Um, who am I? I'm, I'm a chiropractor. I, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in anatomy and psychology. I, uh, I have um, uh, a degree in chiropractic neurology, or, or what's often called functional neurology. I practice in Montreal. I've been practicing for almost 25 years now. And uh, yeah, I do love uh, functional neurology, everything that's related to the brain, everything that's related to uh, how we function and why we do the things we do. Uh, very passionate about all that. So thank you for, for the invitation. And what was it uh, as a chiropractor that got you interested in chiropractic or functional neurology? I think it's the, uh, <clears throat> you know, in chiropractic, we, we often hear of these uh, miracle stories of, of people who have, you know, gotten adjustments and had miraculous changes. You know, the, 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 the history of chiropractic itself began with a, a man regaining his sense of hearing after an adjustment. So I always found that really intriguing uh, from a chiropractic point of view. But even before that, when I was studying anatomy, I, I, I just I, I had a love for, for the brain and for neurology. Um, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure why. I think it's just, it, it's so central to who we are and how we see things. Um, yeah, it just seemed like a logical thing to, to fall in love with. <laughs> Was it during your studies? Because obviously you studied anatomy and physiology at McGill before you went on to do chiropractics. What's interesting about studying anatomy without wanting to use an application is I would think what you're taught is pretty objective right and you're just you're just being taught the different pieces of the puzzle without saying this system is more important or you know we need to adjust we don't need to adjust you know which you know as soon as you go into let's say physiotherapy or chiropractics we'll use the anatomy but then we'll put specific focus on different parts would you say it's by just learning anatomy that you took a liking to the nervous system or did it happen afterwards hmm. i think you know it was an interesting thing for me as to why I, why I decided to become a chiropractor. Like I made that decision when I was studying anatomy at McGill. I was on my way to becoming a medical doctor. And uh, we had a career day and we had different you know people come in to speak to us about their professions. And, and a chiropractor came in. And one of the, the, the things, you know, you, you, ever, you ever kind of feel something inside of you and then, and then, you know, you're not really sure how to express it. And then you meet somebody and they, they say something and you're like, that's it. You know, it kind of turns you on. That's what happened when I heard this chiropractor speak. I, I, I always had this fascination and love for the, the human body, for physiology. And this chiropractor, you know, I, I'll never forget one, one of the things he said was, uh, the body is intelligent. Hmm. And, and, and with all my passion about learning about the human body for, for so many years, that sort of notion was always in the back of my mind. But when I heard him express it, I thought, wow, that's it. You know, the body is intelligent. And, and you know, that's one of the central tenets of chiropractic is how can we uh, use that body's intelligence to help it function the way it was designed to function? Yeah. It's, it's the notion, and that's what I've loved the whole time about chiropractic philosophy. And uh, there is a parallel with osteopathic um, philosophy as well, because obviously the origins are quite close. But it's this notion that the body is quite capable. And it's this optimism about the fact that if guided along the right path, the body will actually make a lot of the right decisions. So this, uh, this notion of trust in life and in, in who we are, uh, maybe right now needed more than ever, considering that some are fearful, and as we should be, because obviously this is real. Uh, but but the notion of trust in the body, I think uh, maybe could be spoken of a little bit more, and I think people would be better for it. 
Absolutely. You know, and, and that's, that's one of the things that you, you hear a lot of talk these days with the whole COVID uh, pandemic is, <clears throat> you know, there's talk of vaccines and all these other things. And I'm certainly no expert in immunology, but there's no question that the, the stronger you are, uh, the healthier you are, uh, the more resistant you would be to any sort of infection, right? We, right. we very clearly in the research that those who are most at risk are the ones who have pre-existing conditions and who are, you know, immunosuppressed to a certain extent. So, uh, yeah, that fits right into what you're saying as far as respecting this this intelligence, this ability to maintain homeostasis and strength uh, inside the body. And it's it's not unique to chiropractic, like you're saying. You know, most quote quote alternative healthcare. Uh, have this this philosophy and um, if you even listen to the the mainstream narrative i mean it is it is that we're told to stay healthy to eat well i mean you know mr legault uh, likes to say that maybe one glass of wine per day is fine and and it you know and it's true it kind of gives you the feeling that okay like you know you're allowed to have fun because that actually makes you healthier if you do have fun uh but he did say one not three uh so <laughs> for people that want to use the narrative and just get drunk every night he did say one glass not three uh so yeah so as long as everyone's aware that uh, the quantity Entity had been specific, uh, spe specified, right? Uh, <laughs> I've been following through. I mean, I like to think that I listen to some of what they're asking. Uh, so you I just pick and <laughs> I have a few biases, so I just pick and choose along my, my preferences. Um, one of the interests that you and I have, uh, based on the discussions we've had recently on Facebook and based on a, um, a live that I saw you have uh, most recently, was the notion that there's an, a link between how we feel physically and how we feel inside of our heads and it's something that's close to my heart because I, 14 years of practicing posturology what i had noticed was that when people were getting structurally more resilient uh, they were also getting more resilient in their heads and they were better at managing emotions and they did better cognitively. And, and we know now there's a whole bunch of research actually demonstrating the whys of that. Um, so, uh, and I saw that you had the same interests and that's why I really want to get you on a live so we could have that discussion. And so that uh, a bunch of the, the people that, that know the work that I do could get your perspective on it. Um, so first off, we had developed a few key points we wanted to, to discuss. What would be your uh, definition, Dr. Ford, of emotions and of emotional uh, regulation? And, you know, as you know, there's a lot of controversy around how to define these sorts of things, right? Like it's, uh, we're, we're putting, you know, these these words towards these observations or these feelings that we have. So, so obviously I like, uh, Yak Pen, 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 Skep, uh, Pankseps, uh, description of, of emotions. Uh, yeah. most will describe emotions as being behaviors, uh, instinctual or impulsive behaviors that basically are there for our survival. You know, like, like, like all circuits in the nervous system have a purpose for our survival. And what Panksepp basically said is he feels that there's seven primary emotional states that he's discovered through, um, you know, basically stimulating different parts uh, deep the, of the deep brain of different animals and seeing how they react. And um, he says that those emotions, that those seven emotions can, can be categorized into two parts. So you have four that are more uh, supportive of our survival. And he says it's, uh, play, um, uh, seeking behaviors, uh, lust, and care. So seeking in order to, to find food, to find resources, shelter, etc. Play, which is a, a very much a social bonding kind of behavior. Um, lust for procreation, to find a mate, and care is to take care of the offspring. Um, mm -hmm. So those are more, you know, quote, quote, positive or supportive of, of our survival. Then there's the three others that are more quote quote negative or 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 uh you know protective of our of our survival so there's fear uh to basically you know escape behaviors when when you're in danger there's um um uh, anxiety not really anxiety i think he said uh what was the word um it's kind of a sadness or a grief or panic. I think panic was the word he used. And that's again, related to social bonding. So it's, it's the, the, the phenomenon of separation from those that we've bonded 
two. Uh, and then there's rage. Rage is, mm. is the, the, that, that energy to, to make us fight for our resources or if somebody's threatening to take our, our resources. So, so those are the, um, the emotions uh, that, that I sort of ascribe to, but there's different you know, uh, ways to classify them, et cetera. And, it's, and, and most will say that the difference between a feeling and, a, and an emotion is that a, an emotion is more subconscious Mm -hmm. Whereas a feeling is more conscious, so we can we can sort of appreciate the the emotion, you know, happiness, sadness, etc. This is our cognitive awareness of the the lower brain uh, emotional feeling. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you look at Joseph Ledoux's uh, definition of an emotion, and a few of the authors that he'll state, uh, he'll particularly say that it's not as if animals, for example, because we often like to make the difference between, you know, what belongs to animals, what belongs to us, and what's the difference, uh, and what are the differences, you know, that you find in the nervous system. And, and what Ledoux will say is that essentially the emotion um, is conscious, and that um, sensations um, happen to both, again, animals and, and humans, but that the interpretation of that sensation is really what you call the emotion. Um, and so in that sense, you know, he'll go about saying that unless you have consciousness, um, you really don't have so-called emotions, but you're going to have behavior. And, uh, and then behavior, right, he traces all the way back to bacteria um, at the very beginning of, of the first signs of life. And he'll say, bacteria already had that capacity to position themselves um, favorably for survival, yet they didn't feel emotions because they didn't have a central nervous system. Um, and he basically positions that you need a central nervous system to feel emotions. What do you make of that difference between behavior versus emotions based on what he, uh, he stated? It's, uh, it's really interesting when you talk about the consciousness or the realization of, of an emotion and, and how it relates to the body as well. And this is where it gets really tricky. You know, like how do we know, really, how do we know scientifically that a dog is happy or sad, right? Like, like we, we, we perceive it and we sort of judge it based on our own understanding or, or, or feelings of what that is. But hence lies the, the controversy. You know, how do you, how do you really study this stuff and how do you classify it? And, and classifying by itself is often very tricky. You know, if, if, we, if we're in a holistic model and, and we understand how everything is really interconnected, it's almost unfair to kind of snip it apart and say, well, this does this, this does that. But we do it so that we can better understand it, right? So right. It's, it's for us maybe more than it is for the appreciation of what is, right? Because we, we have this need to create structure. So um, we give names to things and then sometimes we, you know, five or 10 years down the road say, well, you know, we said this, but what we really meant was that. And, and then really what we're observing might be the exact same thing. It's just that our understanding of it necessitates that we revamp the, uh, the, 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 the very vocabulary that we've used to describe it. So, you know, science, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on science as being, you know, to help us find the truth. But it's interesting in that science changes o over time. You know, and truth <laughs> thereby changes over time time so, so what, yeah, what is true today yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so so let's say we almost get the concept of emotion then the next question would be um what is emotional regulation and what would you say is the role of chiropractic neurology in emotional regulation so so emotional emotional regulate like most most systems in, in the nervous system that have a, a go also need a stop right or else we'd be go 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 and we wouldn't be able to stop so so emotions emotion right it's emotion that's not a that's not a coincidence the term actually yeah. comes from the fact that it it moves us it energizes us right emotions make us act so that's very much a gas pedal sort of sort of phenomenon when we talk about the nervous system so emotional regulation is is related to those circuits that are able to tone down uh, the gas pedal or the the behavior. So it's it's you know it's turning down the volume. It's it's uh, you know when you tell somebody who's 
you know, a little bit uh, anxious or flying off the handle, you know, calm down. That's, that's what emotional regulation is. You know, it's, it's the calming down <laughs> of those, those energizing uh, behaviors or emotions. And would it be why physical activity has been proven to decrease stress because it involves movement? What would you say is your take on that? Yeah, that's a really you know interesting way to think about it. You know, we we think of stress, for example, as the the you know being in a fight or flight um, phenomenon, right? Fight or flight. So the fight or flight back in the day you know the the typical example is the, the the tiger or the bear that pops out and we either have to fight this animal to survive or we need to run away to survive and and today we don't have that kind of stress but we've our survival stress is based more on you know our jobs our uh, our relationships our ability to make money uh safety it is very different in in a in a modern world so yeah, that, that, that could be why we, we exercise is so good for us because it taps into that same mechanism that our ancient brain or our ancestors brain needed in order to vent off that energy, right? Because I mean, to actually run away or fight the tiger, you had to get physically involved, right? I mean, the very nature of the response had to be physical at a certain point in time to manage the stress. Now, whether or not you made it alive was a secondary thing, but at least you had to respond. So I find it interesting that, you know, for example, in this context, um, we're being told to stay inside and I understand why, but I think it's important for people to also consider that, yes, you want to stay informed, you want to watch what, you know, what we're being told to do, but not to forget to go out there and to move because if you feel stressed from what's happening, maybe one way to fight that is not to watch an extra hour of live coverage on this COVID-19, but maybe it's to go for a jog or um, because quite frankly, often enough, I find people try to reason their stress management and to just, you know, try to work it out in their heads. Um, hence the whole concept of embodiment, right? I was just speaking to a good friend of mine, Stéphane Leblanc. He's a, um, he's a mover and a shaker in terms of he wants to bring uh, consciousness into the uh, leadership consciousness into the business world and a big part of that for him is to say you know what we need to get outside of our heads to create solutions to problems um, I know for a fact I mean not that I have as much hair as you do but I know that when I actually shower and and for the little bit that I have when I wash my hair might just be one of the times where I get most of my ideas in terms of business development and so forth and I find it interesting because it's I'm not even thinking about trying to come up with solutions. I'm just physically active. I mean, you know, like this is, so as, as stupid as it sounds, that's actually where I get, an, or when I do sports, when I'm training, I'll finish my workout and I'll be like, geez, this would be a good idea. And I wasn't trying to develop ideas. I was just actually not thinking. So. Makes perfect sense. You know, I, the, the, the old uh, Einstein, uh, a scenario where, where he, he had a walking path around his house and every time he would get stuck on a problem he would leave his desk and he'd go for a walk and he kept I walking. didn't know that yeah and he I think he, he he lived like quite far away from from where he taught and where he worked and he he would walk to work and he he was a big proponent of, about this idea of physical activity for for your mental state you know and it's anybody who exercises it's obvious, right? You feel better. You think clearer. It's, it's, um, it's really a, a fundamental need. I think that we, we, we have for helping our nervous system, our, our brain work better. You know, I, I often say there's, there's no amount of Sudoku puzzles that you can do. That's better for your brain than exercise. Right. It's, uh, and, and, and you said it perfectly. A lot of people try to think their way out of stress, which is fine. That's, that's, that's a part of it. We were, we're, we're blessed to have those capacities, right. but we tend to forget, you know, let's face it. Most of our, our society is sedentary. You know, we, we tend to forget the importance of, of movement. Yeah. So that might be one of the things that uh, it'd be fun to have Dr. Ruda mention, Oh, by the way, go for a jog, you know, like just, just once. Cause I think people might just forget that in a time like this, it could make the difference between, you know, them feeling anxious or if it lasts too long, even depressed. And we know this has been going on for weeks. Uh, so there is this concern. Psychiatrists even came out to speak today to say, you know what, we need to be present because what we're seeing is 
yes, we might be like flattening the curve for the virus, but there's more and more, you know, distress and emotional and mental issues. So, so something has to give and maybe movement um, can be a part of it. Um, neural development is something that's very close to both yours and, and my heart. And I think anyone in functional neurology who can appreciate uh, neural, well, yeah, neural behavior in an adult has some form of appreciation. So for what happened in the earlier years, what link do you make or what links do you make between neural development and our capacity to manage uh, emotional life as an adult? Neurodevelopment's probably the single most important thing that, that allows us to manage our emotions in adult life. You know, it's um, what, when you look at the development of the nervous system or of the brain, you can, you can look at it in different ways. So, so you can look at the development in a, in a vertical way. Mm -hmm. so, so from 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 bottom to top, for example. So, you know, our our, our spinal cord and, and brain stem are the lower parts of our nervous system, and they they you know we're stimulus response organisms, right? But we have different strategies to use these these stimulus response circuits in order to survive. So, from the brain stem and spinal cord level, uh, it's it's we have reflexes. To protect us, so you, you touch the hot stove and you pull your hand away, right? You don't need cognition. You don't need to think. You don't need to think. It just happens, right? And and from some from the brainstem level, that's where we get more of the limbic centers and the amygdala and and all of these these more what are hypothalamus considered more of the emotional areas of the brain, um, and and they allow us to react to to different stimulations. You know, you have a you know, somebody cuts in front of you in line and you get angry, right? So these are reactions that we have. There, there's still responses to the environment, but they're a little bit more complex in, in how they're, they're produced, right? And from the, the reflexive brainstem to the reactive limbic system, we, we now have the cortical levels, the most developed part of our brain. And this is where, uh, you know, reflection occurs. So reflex, react, re reflect. <laughs> and, and to really understand that part of, of the brain and neurodevelopment, we have to look at how the brain develops really from a back to front uh, mm -hmm. direction as well, right? So, so our sensory lobes are, are in the posterior part and our motor lobes, our responses are, are in the front, in the frontal lobe. And, and the last part to develop in neurodevelopment is that part of the brain that's in front of the front, right? It's the prefrontal cortex, the, 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 what's, what's responsible for executive functions, right? So, and this is where uh, emotional regulation comes from. It's, it's that, you know, you think of the, the, the CEO, the executive of a company, this is where problem solving occurs. This is where prediction occurs. And this is where, you know, regulation occurs. So, so in a sense, these, these more evolved areas have a, an ability to inhibit the lower areas in the nervous system. So, so the brain can inhibit those emotions, emotional regulation. It can inhibit the reflexes that we have. You know, so when, when the doctor taps the, the, the knee, you know, he or she is not just looking for a reaction, but, but they're looking to grade the reaction. If, is it too low or is it too much? You know, and, and, and a hyper reflexive tendon reflex is an indication that the, the cortex isn't working too well, right? Because it's not doing its job of, of inhibiting. So to get access to this infamous prefrontal cortex, because in recent years, more and more um, thought has been given to the notion that the prefrontal cortex uh, is responsible for a whole lot more maybe than was uh, initially appreciated. Um, I think what people need to understand is that you don't just have access to a brain area if only because it's not, uh, um, because it doesn't have a lesion, right? Because if we look at things medically, we'll say, well, everything's functioning well if there's no lesions, if there's no insult to the anatomy. But when we look at things more functionally, what we'll see is, okay, well, you know, this area of your brain is not injured, but maybe it could be stimulated, maybe it could be activated. And then how we would do that is, well, if you look at the lower part of the brain, so brainstem or sensory areas, as you've mentioned in the posterior aspect of the brain, what people need to understand is that all of these are mostly and, and strongly activated in infancy, right? Between zero to 
two years old and let's even include uh, in utero. So what we're saying is if that's not done at the time where it was the most, where you got the most payback out of it, you can always do it later. Uh, it's just that to be aware that if you have these deficits of movement early on, because that's really the only way you have to wire this brain from zero to two, right? You, you can insist on your kid appreciating Shakespeare, but chances are it's just going to be, you know, like they need to move to turn on that brain. What would you say in your practice that you've seen uh, that are maybe some missed steps in infancy that can lead to having a harder time turning on that prefrontal cortex? I think what you're saying is, is key. Movement is really key. Uh, and, and I know you're, you're, you're big on pr uh, primitive reflexes. I think those are something that, that, are, that is very important to, to examine. And I'm, you know, you've been doing this a while, uh, as I have, and, and you can see how uh, quote, quote, treating different uh, movement parameters can have an influence not only on how somebody stands and how they move and how they interact with their environment physically, but it has an effect on their emotions and, and how they think, as we were saying earlier. Uh, and then there's a whole other aspect uh, that influences brain behavior, and that's really from, um, you know, the, 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 the family dynamic or... or, or mm parents right so so you know the, the the things that that affect us the most or that that uh, are are most influential on our brain development and on the the development of of our human brain as a as a species has been movement you know and the ability to to resist gravity stand on two legs etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but also the social aspect is, is very important so you know, when you look at the, the whole evolution of our species and leaving the, the plains of the, in, in Africa, these are, we needed to work together, right? The, the social bonding uh, as a community is very important. And of course, the most important social bonding of all is, is the bonding that we have with our parents. And, and, and it's like you said, like the, it all starts in utero. Like we clearly know now that a, a pregnant woman who is under stress, you know, we know that alcohol is not good for the fetus. We know that, you know, nicotine, smoking is not, but stress is, is overlooked. And it's very clear with research of, of women who are in, you know, abusive relationships when they're pregnant or, or times of war, uh, you know, the, the stress of, of different situations can have a, a dramatic impact on the, the development of, of the fetus in its most crucial time, right? When it's still in utero. And we, we know, you know, the last, the last um, you know, quote, quote, modern day crisis that we had in, in, in Quebec was the, the ice storm, right? When we go back to, to 98, when we were all confined, we had no electricity, there was no food on the shelves and all this. And, and there's actually interesting studies that show that the kids that were born of pregnant women in that period actually had delays in language, had delays in motor development, uh, behavioral problems. So it's, huh. it's really, uh, you know, we talk about the stress of all this COVID stuff. And, and, you know, I often think of those, the women, the, the women that are pregnant right now, this is a crucial time for them to look at how they're dealing with it, to, to look at the relationship with, with their husbands. That, that's another, you know, interesting thing is once, this is this has been repeated over and over again. The the marital satisfaction or the, the the satisfaction that you have in a relationship before and after the birth of a child, right? And 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 it's you mean it changes? <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. Do you have any kids, Matt? No. <laughs> okay, <you're ready>. Not <laughs> yet. <laughs> this is as as uh, wisdom from beyond. Okay. <laughs> but but the uh, the research is clear that that. Um, you know, if, if you ask people how, how happy they are in their relationship, you know, it's at an X level. And then after the birth of their child, it just plummets. It goes way, 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 way down. And, and it's, uh, you know, parents know this. Parents know that it's not easy. You know, and, and, and this is, you know, the happy pictures of my new baby on Facebook. Behind the scenes, it's, you know, the reality is for, I think it's like over 80% or 80% of couples, it's hard. It's not easy. And, and there's actual, you know, studies that show that 
if you, if um, new parents have counseling before they actually have their child, it, it has a dramatic impact on their happiness. And, and, and by default, it's going to have a tremendous impact on, on how that child is raised and how uh, the, the family dynamics or the climate in, in the household affects the development of their brain. I mean, we could, there's a lot of interesting research on, on animal studies that show, you know, at an early age, how how these sorts of things, how comfort, safety uh, relate to the development and how it, how it ultimately affects later in life the person's emotional states. It would make sense because it is so primary to the capacity to even integrate a primitive reflex, really, if you think about it, right? It's so fundamental that, um, and it might explain why in some adults that we work on in a very neuromotor manner, uh, some people, you know, the work sticks to them a lot better and for others it doesn't uh, because I'll use the same te techniques necessarily on everyone, right? Whether you're a, a high level Olympic athlete or Madame Gingras who, you know, like uh, just wants to put a, a, you know, a plate in the cupboard. And then it's interesting how sometimes I'm, I, I find myself surprised that the people I would think that are going to respond the best just based on sometimes like, you know, factors like they're younger, they're, they're healthier, they do more sports. Funny enough, there's cases where um, it, the work doesn't seem to stick to them as well. Uh, whereas for people that maybe come in not looking so good to begin with, funny enough, every three to six weeks, they're doing better and better and better. So um, I, I know I need to look into the effective component more. Uh, ben Napierre, who's uh, obviously, uh, who you know as well, uh, that's, that's definitely, he's a recent father, and that's definitely one of his main interests. And, and I, he's always sending me cool research on that just to keep me in the loop of, okay, you know, like it might not be your, your most interesting like, topic, but like it's a huge part of what you do. So then, then it would be a matter of like, okay, how do you improve that? And I guess this is where psychologists come in, right? So that uh, there could be this, um, do, you, do you find you often have to refer uh, to other professionals and let's say maybe like in this case, psychologists in order to get functional neurology to, let's say to work on patients? I wouldn't say often. Um, often people come to me, you know, when, when they've seen everybody else. So, right. so, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's, um, I have to perform. <laughs> it's like, no you know, choice. It's, yeah. It's like, you got it. You got to make this work. But of course, of course I will refer, I will refer out when, when needed, when I, when I see there's a need. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I really believe in, in recognizing your strength and, and your limitations. So, so it's nice to have, a collaborative network around you of good people who, you know, not, no, not only recognizing your strengths, but the strengths of other people and what they excel in and, and being able to identify the patients who will benefit more from somebody else. Yeah, that's crucial. You know, we, 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 we don't have all the answers in functional neurology, but we're, we're very good at piecing things together. Mm -hmm. We're very good at, you know, like you're saying earlier, looking at the subtleties of things, you know, and, and determining how things are connected and how you can do something that might be, might look on the surface of being completely unrelated to the symptoms that the person's presenting with, but it's kind of a backdoor approach to, to helping the person. This is not in the list of things we had said we would speak about, but I find it interesting because it's about this notion of looking at, uh, at the issue from a multifaceted uh, standpoint. Um, Joseph Ledoux was giving a talk uh, not too long ago, and at the end of the talk, people were allowed to ask questions. And as much as he speaks about the brain and emotions, he never mentions the gut. And uh, so one person in the crowd stood up and said, how do you see the gut playing in this whole picture that you draw for us? And, he, and his answer was, and then I'll ask you what your perspective is, because I'm curious to know, but he said, listen, he says, I know it has a role to play, but he says, I'm a brain guy and it's my bias and I'll stand by it. So essentially, he wasn't saying it wasn't relevant, but I thought it was kind of a disappointing answer where because he hadn't looked into it, it was hard for him to, to appreciate it, you know? Uh, whereas obviously when you look at the research, it's really hard to say that this is not a significant component. So in your line of work, in terms of achieving results, whether it be structurally pain level or emotional regulation, how much have you had to intervene or work with people that do work 
on a metabolic uh, level. I, I agree that it's crucial. Uh, I agree it's very, very important. And, and if you're looking at the brain as a, a, an integ integrative organ, you can't not talk about the gut. You know, and, and now we have, we have the gut-brain axis. And, and in the last few years, it's become more and more obvious the importance between the gut and, and the brain. But you know, when you just think of it from a, a, a very, again, the brain is there to keep us alive. And, and at, at its most basic function, what we need to be alive is energy. Once you lose your energy, that's it, you're done, right? And how, where do you get your energy from? You get it from food. So if your gut isn't optimized or working as well as, as it should be, uh, the brain is lacking the basic energy, nutrients, uh, the things it needs just for itself to stay alive. So, so you know, the, the enteric system and the, the way that the, the nervous system really envelops the entire GI tract, it's there as our second brain, quote, quote, and its importance is there because in order for the brain number one to survive, it needs to make sure that the, the gut and the digestive system is working at its best. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's very, very important. And, and getting back to as far as treating patients, very often it's, you know, the, the basic things, you know, going back to what you're saying, moving, eating well, you know, sleeping well, uh, you know, stress management, good, healthy relationships in your life. Sometimes it's not that complicated, you know, but, but I, I tend to have the view when I approach uh, patients to always start with the fundamentals. And, and mm -hmm. once the fundamentals are in place, then we can go into more complex uh, aspects. I'm going to ask you a tough question. Um, and it's something that I'm not struggling with, but definitely debating in my head. Like I'm, I'm more of a brain guy than a gut guy, just because it's like, I don't do gut work. I'll refer out. Right. Um, and when I read up on evolution and, and, you know, of the species and the way that life came about on this earth, bacteria definitely came first, or at least, you know, that's, and then 3.8 billion years ago, and the nervous systems came about much, much later and then human beings about 7 million years ago. So, and then the capacity to produce ATP came way before, uh, you know, nervous system. So this whole notion of energy that you bring up. So I guess my question is, we keep talking about the gut as the second brain. Would you say that to some extent it could be seen as the first brain? Yeah, that's an interesting way to, to think of it, you know, and we could... Uh... We could even go further and say, well, okay, if the gut is so important, once you, you absorb all these nutrients, you know, where, where do they go from there? And how do they get there? You know, so, so we could think of another nervous system or another brain, which is our cardiovascular system, right? So, so the, the, this visceral aspect that we have is really there as a, as a fundamental part of keeping us alive and, and, and uh, making our brain function. And yes, absolutely, you're absolutely right. We could say, well, maybe even the cardiovascular is number one and, and the, 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 the GI is number two. I, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to think of it. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm definitely brain biased very much, uh, you know, the way that Ledoux was answering this woman, uh, if only because it's what I think is most interesting. It's what I typically want to improve. But then, you know, lo and behold, when you keep looking at things holistically, at some point you maybe you think, geez, you know, what I look at is really important, but it also helps you understand why maybe in some cases you got results and in others you didn't, although you kept applying more or less the same principles. You know, with chiropractic adjustments, for example, some people hold the adjustments better than others and, and some people have pain reduction much faster than others and you manipulated the same segment you know, more or less the same way. So this, this variability of, so that's what makes it interesting. It's, it's to look at, you know, when things work out the way we planned, um, it's, it's great for the patient. We don't really learn a whole lot. It doesn't force us to evolve. It's with the people that we struggle with that we kind of go like, okay, so obviously this person deserves life. They deserve to have full function. And there's a reason, there has to be a reason because they're human beings. So they deserve to have a human being 
you know, full experience. Um, and it's, it's needing to look into all these things. Um, important periods that, that uh, you would say in neurodevelopment can, um, that can have repercussions. One of the key examples um, that I'll give you is one I've learned from Robert Melillo. He says, he says, you know, between 12 to 13 months of age to be able to say you stand upright and you walk, some will say it's only a month difference. But what he says is the research has been showing that if you walk at 13 months versus 12, there is a difference later on in how healthy you'll be and how you'll manage emotions, cognition. So that's one that really shocked me, knowing that it was just one month difference at such an early age, but that that had relevance. What would you say are a few of the ones you've either read about or saw in your practice that were uh, that are important to know of? As far as... Far as uh... Like targets, yeah, neurodevelopment targets that matter in terms of you know adulthood and so forth. It's um, it's hard to say, you know, and, and I, I'm familiar with that, you know, that that span of 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 uh, standing up. There's, the context is also important, you know, like like uh, crawling as an example. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we tend to think of the importance of crawling and cross cross crawl patterns, uh, and and when that should be achieved. There's some cultures that don't put their kids on the ground, right? There's some cultures that keep the, the, the babies wrapped, you know, near them. And, and, and for whatever reason, the ground is dirty or the ground is dangerous. Um, so it's very contextual. And I think, like you were saying about Joseph Ledoux, it's one thing to take a piece of research and understand it. And it's another thing to really extrapolate it. And, and if there's one thing that the nervous system uh, tells us is that it's it's extremely complex you know like like we can make generalizations but the context and and all the other factors that, that come into to somebody's uh development like I, I i would argue that you know i would rather have a kid walk later in life and be in a healthy household where there's a lot of love and and a good diet than than you know having them have perfect movement right we we, yeah. we do have a margin of error in, in our movements that are permissible. You yeah. know, we, we, you have people with short legs, athletes. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, so uh, yeah, uh, although it's, it's interesting to take from these researchers and, and, and different studies that are done, we have to keep in mind that those are very, very specific things. And, and I think that's part of the, the, the challenge and the, the joy of being a practitioner is to take the research from all over the place and then try to, assimilate it and try to apply it to the patient that's in front of you. 100%. Yeah, it's context. And it's true that whenever we look at any body of research, you know, to draw out a few variables and try to draw a conclusion about life is a bit of a weird experiment. I mean, it's the way research works, but then it's always a matter of saying, okay, you and I are both clinicians. So it's like, okay, I saw the research, but then the bigger picture is, yeah, the kid can crawl at like exactly two and a half months, like the Doman brothers are saying, but if he doesn't feel loved and protected by his parents, uh, might not work, you know, things might not work out optimally, even if we have the, the target, right, of the, the, the crawling. Um, and one of the because some, some, sometimes parents get, uh, you know, very worried with these milestones um so so again i think i think we got to take that into perspective you know just just for the parents are stressed enough already <laughs> like we're saying so we'll yeah that to that. and i mean it, there are countries where some things just aren't possible so for example when i teach i always speak about this notion of car seats like no matter how much of a like brain aware parent that you are and you want to do let's say uh, quote unquote everything right well if you plan to go from a to b and the kid has to follow you in the car uh, you're gonna have to put the kid in a car seat and yes that will make him you know that will verticalize him and that's not ideal but then what's ideal you know leaving the kid at home <laughs> unattended so so there's going to be some give and take i think if people are just made more aware of what is optimal without going cuckoo about it just knowing that you know if the kid wants to jump on the bed then maybe you just stay there and you let him jump on the bed because that'll work on the vestibular system and if the kid wants to walk on the side of the sidewalk you know maybe you just stay right next to him instead of saying no um because kids will be daring that's how they develop but i think what we've done is we're just 
we're just so scared of so many things that often enough, uh, Dr. Brico calls it uh, instinctual repression. Like it's beyond us. We don't even realize we're just always saying no uh, out of fear. So there's things we can't change, but then there's things we have power over. And if people are educated, then maybe they won't worry so much about the exact, oh, this didn't happen by five months. It's just working with the concepts instead of sticking to the dates, you know? Yeah, I agree. My One of the questions we had here, what, uh, what has the greatest influence on kids' development on emotional regulation? You touched on that, but are there any other points you'd like to bring forward when it comes to that? We talked about what, what happens in utero and the first, you know, the, the, the parents, the health of the parents and the relationships, the atmosphere in the household. There's, um, you know, and, and you, can, you can take that further into, you know, going back to what we said about the importance of, of uh, eating and, and the digestive system as an example. I don't know if you've seen those studies by uh, Harry Harlow with the, the monkeys, the, the wire mother and the clock mother. Have you seen? No, tell me about great- it great great videos on on youtube that you could see it's really remarkable um basically what he did was he he took a newborn monkeys uh away from the mom uh, you know and then there's a whole ethical question about all that but, but basically the studies the studies show that he would take these baby monkeys and he would put them in an environment where there were two quote quote mothers available to him or to her uh, one mother was basically like a wired, you know, a wire mother with, with a bottle that, that, that the monkey could nurse from. And then the other mother, quote, quote, was, was more like a, you know, a soft cloth, almost like a plush toy, but no, okay, nursing, yeah. bottle, no nursing bottle, right? So, so what the, the researchers did was they, they would basically observe the monkeys and see how much time would they spend on one mother or the other. And what's interesting is, is obviously they would need to feed from the wire mother, but once their feeding was taken care of, they would spend most of their time on the cloth mother, right? On the soft, comforting cloth mother, right? So the, once the basic need of food is taken care of for basic survival, newborns need that, that closeness, right? They need that comfort. They need that, that safety, right? And, and, you know, we look at the, we look at, at imprinting, right? How, how baby goslings will, will follow their, their mom. And there's, again, on YouTube, there's some interesting videos from uh, Lorenz, who was, who was famous for studying this with, with birds. And, and again, really funny videos of, of goslings following him everywhere. You know, he'd go for a swim and they're following him. He'd go for a canoe ride and they're following him. And, and it, when you put it into context of, of how, the brain is so immature, especially the human brain, is so immature when it's born. We have these, these instinctive circuits that, that say, you know, stay close to your parents, right? They're, they're your survival models. Right. You know, they're here already. They, they were able to do it. They succeeded. Yeah. Stay close to them. Do what they do, right? And then there's, there's uh, uh, imitate, imitation studies, which, which have shown you know, you can take babies, newborn babies, you know, a few hours old, and you can look at them and, and stick your tongue out. And then they're going to stick their tongue back out at you. And you can make a, you know, a frown, and they're going to frown back. Uh, these are, are really inborn mechanisms that say, you know, whoever you're close to those parents, do what they do, you know, and then there's the mirror neurons, you, you know, about mirror neurons. Again, this kind of goes again talking about our 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 environment our upbringing the atmosphere in our in our house um for those who don't know the mirror neuron uh story or, or the discovery was it was an accidental discovery so researchers in italy were studying the uh the mechanism the neurology behind grasp and they had uh, macaque monkeys they had uh, electrodes uh, hooked up to their brain hooked up to a computer and every time the monkey would grasp uh, a peanut, bzz, you know, the, the neuron would fire and it would be recorded. So bzz, every time bzz, the monkey would grasp the peanut. And then uh, during a break, one of the researchers, you know, saw the, the bowl of peanuts and went and grabbed a peanut himself. And bzz, the electrode <laughs> was sound from, from the monkey. So the, the I didn't whole- know that that's how, that's how they, did, they discovered mirror neurons. 
Yeah, yeah, it was an accident. I didn't know how it happened. Okay, obviously, so many, so many accidents lead to like so much, so much knowledge. Eh? This is, I didn't know that's how they did it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, so it's, it, but it's interesting to see how you can, you know, you have circuits, and and this has been extrapolated to humans, uh, mirror right. neuron systems, right? Right. And and you know, it brings in the idea of empathy, and and you know, can can you, can I tell what's going on in your mind? you know, right now, you know, the, the theory of mind concept. Um, it's really fascinating. And, and I think all of these sorts of animal studies help us understand how the, the, the family is so important to how we develop, you know, how, how, how do you watch your parents get over arguments? You know, are, are, are they the type to throw plates and yell or, you know, are they more, you know, I'm getting out of here. It's the fight or flight, right? And I think as far as emotional regulation, um, I think with all these concepts in mind, we most likely get most of our emotional regulation, our ability to to cope with emotions by watching our parents, you know, and, and the family dynamic that we all go through. You know, we're all we're all dysfunctional, right? <laughs> it's it's a matter of to which extent and on and on which level, really. That's right. <laughs> We've got to work for the next few years, I think. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think we should run out of, as soon as we can go back to work, really, uh, yeah. we should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> can you please tell the audience, uh, Dr. Ferd, where they can find you if they have uh, questions? And I know that you have been teaching courses that are uh, wildly successful. Um, I've been seeing the pictures of the you know the the, the students and uh, you, you get what 50 people per class this is uh, incredible uh, all over the world you've been teaching as yeah, well a lot of fun i've been doing that for for about 10 years now and that's been so uh, fulfilling so much fun so so the seminars i give uh, are, are to chiropractors and it's basically um expanding um how neurology relates to their practice so how how can we better understand neurology and how can we apply it uh, to better help our patients? Um, so, so, so that's adjusting the brain, uh, adjustingthebrain.com, and you can find me on Facebook or, or on my website. Uh, my clinic is in Montreal. We're in uh, NDG, and mm -hmm. uh, that's Freud Clinic. Uh, so, freudclinic.ca or clinicfreud.ca, and and we have a multidisciplinary approach um, there. We do you know, regular chiropractic, osteopathy, massage, nutrition. Uh, and, and I see patients with, uh, with neurology problems, neurological problems, a lot of concussions, uh, people with strokes, people with neurodevelopmental problems, ADHD, autism, uh, movement disorders, uh, dizziness, re really anything that touches the, the neurological system. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my passion is, is helping, helping those patients. And for non-chiropractors, uh, practitioners, or main public that would like to see you speak, are there any types of events that you have on your calendar upcoming? Or, or is it a sign that we need to invite you to uh, different events that are already ongoing? <laughs> I did an interview with Matt Boulay. You could check his uh, <laughs> Facebook page. <laughs> uh, for now, for now I'm, I'm mainly targeting uh, chiropractors because that's, that's what I know best. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to, to speaking for sure. Uh, anyone who's, who's has the same interests as me, who, who gets some value out of, you know, my, my, my sharing. Yeah. I'm, I, I love doing it. Uh, I've been doing it at McGill for, for, you know, over 20 years as well. It's uh, something I don't want to let, let go of. So uh, yeah. So, so. So as soon as we can go back to having meetings of more than two people in a living room, uh, I know I'll be contacting you and I'm sure other people that are listening will as well, because I know you've been teaching to uh, chiropractors for years and other types of uh, professionals within the context of McGill, but I find that the knowledge that you have and the way you express it uh, can benefit uh, the mainstream, but also other types of practitioners that are looking into um, developing a holistic model. And quite frankly, functional neurology is not known enough considering how uh, powerful it is. And uh, I think you'd be the right person to, to bring this forward. So uh, I'll definitely keep in mind what you just, just said right now. And okay. I'll be harassing you as soon as we go back to real life. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs>
<laughs> so thank you for your time. Um, I will tell everyone on Facebook that uh, if they have any questions or comments, uh, they can uh, do so on the thread. Uh, the live uh, that we just recorded will be on my page. And obviously, you're uh, more than welcome to share it on yours. And in the next few days, you and I can answer and comment uh, as uh, questions and comments unfold. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Okay, sounds thanks great. For, uh, thanks for coming, uh, Dr. Efford. Thank you. That was fun. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.